Hey guys, it's Arm Angel. Welcome back to the channel. And today we start my new series, which is a slightly easier to get to grasp with tutorial series on being a better pilot and flying in flight simulators. This is not a ground school. This is not a full on PPL course. I will not teach you to fly a real plane. I need to specify that first. So, ladies, gentlemen, and Sukhoi Superjets, let's get into this. What am I trying to do here? This is a no BS, simplified, really easy to grasp system of going through different aspects of flying from the very basics through to radio navigation, to icing flight, to short field landings, to bush flying, to mountain flying. I'll take you through multiple different aspects of flight in a simplified, easier to grasp way. If you want to learn in more detail, I recommend you go buy a ground school book or you go and actually study into these fields. There is a wealth of information out there if you want extreme specifics. Now, where do we start? We start here on the panel of the aircraft. This is the most important thing to you. And for those of you that fly outside in third person, it can seem really intimidating. We'll go over engine start once we're in the plane. We'll go over the systems and how they operate. But today I'm gonna to keep this really simple. We're gonna go over the really basic stuff, which is the six pack of instruments and one or two others. Now, as you see here, this panel looks confusing, but you see that box in the center outlined with six inside it? Those are your primary flight instruments. And with those six, you can operate and navigate your aircraft within reason. So we'll start at the top. The first is your airspeed indicator, and that has a lot of markings on it. Now we're using knots or nautical miles an hour, and we have numerous arcs on there that denote different things. Now we're using a Cessna 172, and for this model, it has set speeds that it can operate at. We have things like best angle of climb, VX. We have best rate of climb, VY. Of course, angle being more steep, 60 knots. Best rate of climb would be 76 knots. Minimum safe maneuvering speed is about 82 knots. And we have flap speeds, cruise speeds, velocity to never exceed, and a max crosswind component, which for this aircraft is 15 knots. Note that is max demonstrated crosswind component. That's what it's rated for by the manufacturer. You can go higher with caution. So let's look at this. The first thing here is the white arc. Now, the white arc is our flaps extended speed. Now our stall speed for this aircraft, dirty, and I'll explain dirty and clean. Dirty is with things you can extend out, like flaps, like landing gear. Here our gear's fixed. So with flaps out, our stall speed for this aircraft is 33 knots. That's the bottom of the white arc. Now the top of the white arc is the fastest speed you can fly with flaps extended without damaging them, which in this aircraft is 110 knots. Now you'll notice that our green arc, which is our clean speeds, is higher at the bottom. That's because the flaps extend the wing surface, increase the surface area, allow you to fly slower whilst maintaining lift. If you want to know more about the Bernoulli principle, go find Google, but right now, the Bernoulli principle might as well be a pizzeria, okay? So, for the moment, flaps, you can fly slower. They help you to stay aloft at a slower speed, which makes landing a lot easier. Now, of course, you will stall sooner, which here is 44 knots. Now, the top of that green arc is our maximum cruise speed, which is 127 knots. That is how fast you should realistically be taking this aircraft. Typically in this, with this engine, in a descent. Now from 127 up to 158, that is our yellow arc, there's our caution range. That caution range is speed you can get into, but should probably get out of. Now, 158 knots, with the red line is there, that is our velocity that you never exceed. That is where structural damage starts to happen and bits fall off. Yeah, not good. Next instrument here is our artificial horizon. This is one of a number of instruments powered by the vacuum system, it's a gyro-based system, just like the uh, vertical speed indicator and turn slip we'll come to next. The artificial horizon is essentially, think of it like a mini flight simulator inside your airplane. It shows you where you're heading relative to the ground. Obviously, right now it's off, so it's in its kind of flopped position. But imagine that was you, you'd be climbing and you'd be banking really weirdly to the left. But when it's straight, which you'll see in the aircraft, the line is the horizon. Above it, you're climbing. Below it, you're descending. And if you're side to side, you're rotating by a set amount of degrees. 
Next is our altimeter. This shows us how high we are. Now that little knob at the bottom allows you to calibrate it because the air pressure changes every day. Meaning that you need to put in the local air pressure for the airport you're at or landing at to make sure that it's correct. Now in default weather it's 2999 and 2. Nice and simple. And if it changes you can technically cheat in flight sim and press B to set the bar barometric pressure. But if you tune into the METAR for an airport on the flight sim radio it will tell you what the pressure there is. Easy answer. Perfect altitudes every time. Nice and simple, it goes round, the number gets bigger, the higher you are. Next we have vertical speed. Now, each of those bars is 100 meters per second. Or feet per minute, sorry, feet per minute. I get, I get that one weird sometimes in my head. Feet per minute, I keep thinking about rockets, meters per second. Feet per minute, so 500 feet per minute, 1000 feet per minute, 1500 and 2000. Up or down. Now, we'll go across this when we're actually flying, but you'll see it go up and down. It'll move around a lot. It means your rate of climb or rate of descent. Now, the next one here is a horizontal or a directional gyro. It's probably the best word to use here because this does not combine a VOR system as well. We'll get into that later in the radio navigation section. Essentially, you've got a bug there for heading. You've got a bug to calibrate it because when you start a flight, you should slave that to the same direction as your whiskey compass, which is on top of the actual window post. Tells you which way you're heading. Nice and simple. Now, last of the six primary flight instruments is our turn slip indicator. Now, the little aeroplane symbol will roll side to side as you do, showing you your rotation around the longitudinal axis, so the length of the aircraft, side to side, so ailerons. Now, the ball at the bottom, it's like a spirit level for your aeroplane. It, this also powered by the vacuum system and a gyro, it, it basically stays at the bottom with gravity so that as your plane rotates around the vertical axis with the rudder it shows you how much you're deflecting from the direction you're traveling in which is why when we use our rudder to coordinate a turn it stays centered it means we are rotating with the airflow with the direction of travel okay now last two things we'll talk about in this video are the rpm gauge at the bottom there one to keep an eye on green arc good above red bad simple Last stack here is your radios and GPS systems. Top to bottom, audio panel, so audio for various devices. If you're tuned into a beacon, you can actually have the audio playing for the more frequency of it. Two GPS units here, nice and simple, we'll get onto those later. Autopilot and transponder. Transponder is a beacon in your aircraft that sends out a signal to ATC, showing them where your aircraft is. It is a nice simple system you set a code to it it tells them exactly which aircraft you are they'll be giving you one or you'll be using a default one which is a standard vfr one 7000 in most of the world 1200 in the us there's other variations okay right this is all we'll look at in my little ground school section here keeping it simple we'll come back to other instruments as we refer to them in more specifics moving on next portion is the traffic pattern now, this is often one of the most confusing things people come to when it comes to flying. The traffic pattern is a box. It could be either side of the runway. For example, if we're going to runway 34, which is the way this is set up, as a left pattern or left traffic for runway 34, going the runway direction is upwind. You'll rarely fly that unless you're going around. Or taking off and staying in the pattern. Crosswind is where you're flying away from the runway and then you'll turn downwind to go parallel to it. Then you'll make your turn to base, which is where you're flying towards the runway. And then the final turn to line up is final, which is where you're descending. Typically recommended to be a thousand feet. It's 800 in a lot of places, and this is above ground level, okay? Aircraft, airports will have on their charts published altitudes. In flight sim, thousand feet, 800 feet. Either's good, unless you know specifically, okay? It's really simple. So if we were doing a right pattern, which we can do, in fact, is done here, but I'll be flying a left one, even though they don't actually do it at Orcas Island. A right pattern would just be flipping it the other way around. Nice and simple. We'll demonstrate it far easier in the aircraft. Of course, if we're doing one six, we just turn everything around on its head. Typically, you'll join a pattern when you arrive at an airport on the downwind. Typically from 45 degrees where the corner with crosswind and downwind is, you'll come in, you'll turn onto downwind so you'll fly towards the runway at an angle turn go downwind turn base turn final we'll deal with that in the simulator in a moment 
Speaking of which, let's go to the simulator. Hey guys, welcome to the ground here at Orcas Island, and we're flying the Cessna 172 today. Now, there are two versions of this aircraft. One with the base game, which has the glass panel, and higher versions of the game have the version which we're using with the regular instruments. However, the principles we go over here are relative to any aircraft. Pretty much any aircraft. So this is just a choice I made. Let's go inside. So inside the cockpit, we see the instruments we talked about. I'll hide the yoke for you just a second. Now we have the parking brake there, which you should have on when you start. You'll notice all our systems are off right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to start the battery. Battery's on. And because my battery's on, I'm going to flick on my nav lights to show my power's on. I'm in the aircraft. Now down here we'll have our fuel selector. We have two tanks, one in each wing. They're not connected all the time in case you get a leak in one. You don't lose all your fuel. You might get sucked out by the air pressure. Simple principle. But we select a tank. Now obviously when flying and using fuel from a certain tank, after a while you want to use the other tank to balance it out because if one wing is heavier, you'll turn in that direction. Pain in the ass. Putting our fuel cut off. Mixture's already in for me, full rich. Now what's mixture? Mixture is the amount of fuel to air ratio in the engine. Simple terms, full forwards, more fuel to the ratio of air. Further back, more air to the ratio of fuel. So less fuel, more air. You're balancing it out essentially at sea level. Full rich is good. Above 3,000 feet you start leaning out. We'll cover leaning in a different topic. But less as you go up, simple metric. In fact, the simple way to go about it is look at your engine exhaust gas temperature instrument and lean it back after 3,000 feet until it the EGT peaks out. Nice and easy. So, let's go for a start up here. Everything is looking good for our start. We'll put a fuel pump on just to assist in fuel through the engine. Now, unlike a car engine, which is basically on because the fuel pump's providing it fuel, an aircraft will suck fuel without a fuel pump on. Passively. In most cases. Now, in this kind of aircraft, we have magnetos. These will keep the engine turning under its own power. They're redundancies in the aircraft engine. So rather than it being simply operating because it's got fuel being injected, like a modern car engine it has, if I lose my electrics in this aircraft, the engine will still technically operate. So we have left and right magnetos. And then we have both, which is our default flight setting. Now to start, we go from both to start... And poof, engine starts. Now, typically, if you're just clicking the little switch there, like holding and dragging, you'll notice here. It doesn't stay in start. It'll click back. It's spring-loaded. It'll do that in a real plane. So we put our alternator on, which is basically our generator of sorts, which draws, generates power with the engine turning. Recharges the battery, keeps our systems good. And that allows us to operate our avionics, which are here. So, by the way, when I started the engine, I should have actually put my beacon light on before I did that to signify I started my engine. Now, before I taxi, I'll put my strobe lights on. Strobe lights are the blinky ones on top. So, these are our nav lights here. Red for port or left. And green for starboard or right. How do you remember which is which? Is there any red port wine left? Port, you know, the wine, the fermented wine drink. Yes. Is there any red port wine left? Why are they port and starboard? Technically, it's port and steerboard. Viking ships used to have a steering board on the side of the hull. They would always dock nose in to the pier with the pier on their left side. Because the steering board, their rudder, was on the side of the hull at the back, not under it. And you didn't want to dock with your rudder jammed up against the dock. So they always docked port side. This was always the port side, steerboard side, starboard. Now, that's our beacon on top of the tail. To marker for identification purposes and with these bad boys on the strobes where the hell are the strobes on the 172 that's it at the back of the, the tail there it's a bit light but either way we'll go inside now okay so aircraft systems are good strobes are on we're going to be moving fuel pumps can go off now yoke is back on now to get the aircraft moving obviously you want to push pull in your parking brake you don't want that You'll need to give it a bit more gas than you expect to get it started. It weighs a lot. It's heavy. You're moving it by pulling it through the air. So it's not like the wheels are actually turning. There's no torque there to apply to the wheels. So you'll have to give it a bit more power than you'd want initially to get it rolling. But then you can back off. Then we taxi out to the runway. This is the easy part. Follow the markings on the little taxiways. It may get more complex at bigger airports. But here, 
we taxi out to this yellow line and we follow it down to the end. Now, bigger airports with multiple taxiways will have signs denoting what the taxiways are, which you can reference to a chart of that airport, or have the computer do it for you with a little follow me line. Now we'll taxi down here, keep it about 10, 15 knots max really. Knots and nautical miles now, as I mentioned, they are what's used in aviation and boating. Now you'll see here, with the runway marking there, taxiway A1, which is this little side piece here, and we have this line here, double yellow lines on roads mean don't cross, yeah? Same thing in aviation. This means don't cross it without permission to take off. Now if you're at a towered airport, you'll hold here, you'll call them holding short of the runway. So here, holding short runway 34, ATC will say, November 403 Sierra X-ray, winds 5 knots 270, clear for takeoff. They'll give me immediate wind conditions and they'll clear me for takeoff. They'll never say anything like cleared until it's time for takeoff. So in this instance, if it's untowered, I would call in 403 Sierra and uh, 403 Sierra X-ray, AUKUS traffic, holding short 34 for departure. If nobody has said on the radio recently that they're arriving or taking off, and I have visually checked both directions, no, I'm clear, I will say 4030, X-ray, AUKUS traffic, entering 34, taking off to the north. I will not enter till I know it is safe to do so. But we know it's safe to do so, there's only us here. I'll put in a notch of flaps for takeoff. We know our speed for rotation in the 172 is about 55 knots. Nice and easy. So we'll now pull out here onto where the numbers are and we will accelerate. Now keep, use the rudders to keep yourself centered on the runway and don't be tempted to pull back too soon. Wait for the aircraft's desire to rotate. Good ballpark, a bit of a way into the green arc. So 50 knots, 55 knots, we'll pull back slightly here. We'll keep ourselves centered there and the aircraft flies itself off the runway nice and easy. So typically for a good climb, full throttle here, initial climb, keeping my her end of my cowling on the horizon line. That gives us about five to 10 degrees nose up. I keep myself centered here on my course of three, four. Nice and simple. We'll go up to about a thousand feet here, then we'll start our work. We're just gonna do a quick traffic pattern and go over the principles of that here. Typically, we won't do a left traffic pattern here at Orcas Island, and you'll see why. It is very hilly, which complicate matters, but I'm not scared of hills, so. We'll pull our flaps in here. Nice and easy. We'll just throttle back a little bit. We'll apply some trim. Trim is this wheel here down below the yoke. You see that? It's moving. That is a small tab on the elevator, which as I move it, it changes the direction of it. What this does is it changes the position, or neutral position of the control surface to allow me to relieve pressure on my hands. So I don't have to keep holding the yoke back at a certain position to keep climbing. I can just let go, like I have now, and the aircraft stays level. So let's make our turn to our crosswind position here. We'll throttle back to about 2250. And I'm gonna trim it down a little bit here and hold the aircraft level, and I'll start a left-hand turn. So we're looking for about 240-ish. So keeping the ball centered as my aircraft rotated around here on this instrument, you'll see I'm turning, but I'm level. If I let go of the rudder pedals and I crank it over, watch where the ball goes. Whee! Yeah, all over the place. So we're about level here for our crosswind now, and we'll see there we are basically crosswind. So once we're a little bit further out, we'll turn to our downwind leg. Here should do for a rotation out. We'll just extend it down but I'm just gonna turn gently in here till we're paralleling the runway. And you'll see the hills ahead and why we don't do a left pattern, but I did it for the diagram, so I need to demonstrate it this way. Guess I painted myself into a corner, right? Okay, so we'll level out here. We're about a thousand feet, nice and simple for us today. And we'll fly the aircraft along. And once the aircraft airport is basically over here, off our shoulder, off our left shoulder, that's when we turn for our base leg. Now, you can extend it further if you want to. Depends on the day and depends on conditions. You may want a longer final because of weather conditions. You've got a crosswind, you've got visibility. It could be any factor. You can change the, the length. Now, like I said in the intro part, 
Pattern altitudes are typically 1,800 to 1,000 feet. Helicopters typically circuit at about 500 feet. Now, this is why you don't fly over an airport at those altitudes because you have the risk of coming across traffic in that pattern. The pattern allows the aircraft to basically know from radio calls whereabouts in the pattern they are, so you can look for them. Without having to know, you have to look below, look above, look around. If someone says they're downwind, you know they're on that side of the leg at about 1,000 feet or 800. The charts for an airport will show you that. So we're just going to drop down here a little bit towards our 800 foot position. And we are going to be pretty close to these hills, which is why you don't do left traffic typically here. But as we're paralleling the runway there, you'll see the start of the runway for 3-4. And once that gets over our shoulders, so basically once we're past this hill ahead of us, we'll be ready to turn base. Now, sometimes you may overshoot on your base to final corner. Don't panic, just keep the turn going and then turn back to straight on final. Nice and easy. So I'm just throttling back here, letting the aircraft settle, which is going to put me very close to trees, but I like grass in my landing gear, what can I say? We'll maintain about 70 knots here, so we'll put a bit of throttle on as we just descend down slightly. Nice and gentle. Little bit of uh, buffeting here from coming over the hills. Nothing to write home about. And as we come along here, we'll just give it a little bit further until we go. So we look back, runways off our shoulder. This is about a good distance. So I'll just take a little bit further so we can demonstrate well. And I'll extend to here. So a little bit of buffeting there as we came across. In fact, it's just sucking us down a little bit there with the wind direction. So I'm going to throttle back here, I'm going to turn to base. So descending turn to our left, I'm going to put a notch of flaps in here. And as I turn, I keep track of my heading. I know I need to be 3-4 off that side there, so that should be coming up in just a moment. Runway 3-4 is going to be there, just past the island. So a little bit more turn, and we'll see 3-4 is going to be now directly off our 90. So we'll turn here, a little bit more power on because we're quite slow. There we go, keep it coming round. Runway will be off our nose, we went a little bit further because of being higher up, not a problem. So as I said, we just corrected him by tucking in that entry, rotating more than the 90 degrees, and you'll notice now we're basically straight back on course. So you'll rotate gently back towards that heading. In this case, I'm going to give it an extra notch of flaps. And we keep our eyes on the big stripes at the start of the runway. Now, this area here is called the Limburg reference. This is where you want to start flaring, and you'll use this to judge your height above the ground. Not the front went out of the window, but that little corner there. It's a great point to reference. So as I'm coming in here, I'm going to maintain about 55 knots for my approach. A little slow for a 170, but it gives me more time to talk to you guys. Don't trim when you're coming into flare. Any trim you have on short final, you keep it that way. Don't keep messing around with the trim once you're flaring out. Because if you have to go around and you put tons of trim into flare, you can stall the plane straight off the ground. So we're a little bit low here. I'll just give it a notch of throttle. And we're looking just past the numbers. You look past where you actually intend to touch down. Keep your eye on the center line there. Flare the aircraft. I'm just giving it a little bit of stall horn there as I floated it slightly. And we touch down. Now, stall horn doesn't mean I've stalled. Stall horn means that I'm within about 5 10 knots of stalling, which is not a huge deal. Okay? But be cautious of it. Don't leave it screaming. And we stop pretty quickly so we can just exit straight onto the taxiway. Nicely done. So, not my best landing, but not everyone will be. I guess it's the pressure of recording and trying to teach you guys how to fly a plane that I won't be as clean as I possibly could be. It's always the landing that no one's watching that is the best one. That's for every pilot, I guarantee you. Um, in general, flying is not complicated. Flying is as simple as you want to make it. And as long as you follow basic principles and procedures, it is very safe, it is very measured, and it is very organized. Now, in this term, we did a short traffic pattern. We did a takeoff and a landing. Now, overall, landing an aircraft is about being careful and taking your time. If you rush, you'll make mistakes. It is about being measured and it is about being cautious. The more time you give yourself to make a decision and to do something without forcing yourself into a position of having to do something, the better. If you make a very, very short turn to final and you have to push the aircraft down to get down, you'll rush, you'll you'll go too fast, you'll lose concentration, you'll make a mistake. So make sure you're doing things in a way in which you can buy yourself the time you need to decide. 
Now, get familiar with your controls. The more familiar you are with your given control setup, the easier it will be. And overall, the more fun you'll have doing this. So it's a very simple process. You've just got to find that right way that suits you. Well, folks, hopefully this was enjoyable. Hopefully those of you who do know all this crap sat through this. The next videos will include things like radio navigation. We're going to go and look at um, flight in mountainous terrain. We're going to look at short field landings, short field takeoffs. We're going to go look at different maneuvers like skidding turns, coordinated turns. We'll look at side slipping. We'll look at crabbing. All various maneuvers you'll need for more spicy airports and weather conditions. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Like uh, the video, please. It really helps me out. Please comment. The comment section here is actually fantastic. I love you guys. And um, please subscribe if you are not. And hopefully I was able to give you at least some information that you didn't already know to help you with your flight some adventures. Bye.